have the honor to open this act in will now the names of the new signatories of the Declaration on War Population. <clears throat> Mr. Secretary General, Excellencies, the act that we hold today as a part of the commemoration of the Human Rights Day has a positive significance and is bound to attract the interest of the international opinion about a problem that notwithstanding its magnitude has not been studied enough by the statesmen of all countries. <clears throat> the present generations are committed not only to the study of the actual problems, but also to the proper way of eliminating the difficulties awaiting future generations. We would be inferior to our historical responsibilities if we were not provident enough to create living conditions for our children and their offspring consistent with their dignity as human beings. Within this order of ideas, it is necessary to turn our attention towards one of the most harmful problems for mankind. It is the problem rightly known as the sickness of our times, that is, the one concerning demographic explosion. It is a matter involving many others, embracing many fields, and it must be examined within the context of all its implications. In order to avoid pitiful and dangerous mistakes in speaking about population policies, we must immediately think on their links with social, economic, cultural, and scientific questions. Fortunately, the Secretary General of the United Nations has successfully obtained growing support for many governments regarding the Declaration on World Population. The initial group of signatories of such an important document was of 12, and now we have the pleasure of sharing with 17 new heads of state the concern arising from the examination of this object. The list of the new signatories. No, the list of the new The new, <clears throat> the new signatories are Australia, Barbados, Denmark, the Dominican Republic, Ghana, Iran, Japan, Jordan, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Norway, Thailand, United Kingdom, United States, Pakistan, Trinidad and Tobago, Indonesia. <clears throat> This particular declaration <coughs> held that a stable and authentic peace shall depend on a considerable part in the way we face the challenge of population increase, and there is no doubt that it must be so. The courageous manner in which this problem has been approached by the few and illustrious persons who have until now studied it and the very hardness of the statistical data on the excessive increase of population in the last decades have already alerted many organizations and governments about the dangers originating in the sickness of our times. Whenever the moral consequences of family planning on society are subject to a study it must be taken into account the moral wickedness having its incontrovertible origin in the crowding suffered by people's victims of the demographic explosion. It is not necessary to go deeply into the most uncivilized corner of this world to see such a dreadful show of social rotting. It is enough to pass over those areas shaping the poverty bell encircling many of our great cities. Referring to those who see the demographic problem above all from a moral point of view, the present president of Colombia said, 
What can they tell us about the forced promiscuity, the frequent incest, the raw character of sexual education, the children's slavery to which the institution leads, the usual abortion, the unconscious surrender to sexual urges during alcoholic excess? And he added, it is impossible for me to pause in order to look into the morality or immorality of contraceptive practices without thinking at the same time in the immoral and often criminal conditions of the very act of conceiving and of the situation that it prolongs through time. In my country, the question of the population excess has been a matter of research and study not only by the government and by some university and professional organizations, but also by the Catholic Church, which has contributed to its examination with unquestionable wisdom. Just in this matter, President Geras does transcribing his message to Congress, his methods must have a well-verified safety and a well-established conformity with the moral order. To put these methods with, within reach of people who need them but cannot have their use is a complementary social task, unquote. As can be seen, the Colombian church has adopted unadvanced and responsible positions. It will, thank you. Now, I have the honor to recognize the distinguished representative of the United Kingdom, Lord Caradon. A year ago, the Secretary General announced and endorsed the Population Declaration, then made by 12 heads of state. And I have been asked to read the conclusions in that declaration. As heads of governments actively concerned with the population problem, we share these convictions. We believe that the population problem must be recognized as a principal element in long-range national planning if governments are to achieve their economic goals and fulfill the aspirations of their people. We believe that the great majority of parents desire to have the knowledge and the means to plan their families, that the opportunity to decide the number and spacing of children is a basic human right. We believe that lasting and meaningful peace will depend to a considerable measure upon how the challenge of population growth is met. We believe that the objective of family planning is the enrichment of human life, not its restriction. That family planning, by assuring greater opportunity to each person, frees man to attain his individual dignity and reach his full potential. Recognizing that family planning is in the vital interest of both the nation and the family, we, the undersigned, earnestly hope that leaders around the world will share our views and join with us in this great challenge for the well-being and happiness of people everywhere. That declaration will increasingly be recognized, so I am sure, as a decisive document in history. Those who signed it, represented here today by the distinguished ambassador of Colombia, have earned the gratitude and the admiration of us all. Their foresight and their courageous initiative have given us all a lead in what is now a worldwide campaign. It is a campaign of immense consequence in terms of human freedom and human dignity and human happiness. 
We follow that lead today by adding the names of 17 more heads of states to the Declaration. And as we do so, we pay our tribute to the leadership of those who showed us the way on Human Rights Day last year. And I have the honor to speak for the 17 nations whose heads of state have their, now added their support to the Declaration. And you, sir, have given us the names of the countries which now support this Declaration, Australia, Barbados, Denmark, the Dominican Republic, Ghana, Indonesia, Iran, Japan, Jordan, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Norway, Pakistan, Thailand, Trinidad and Tobago, the United Kingdom, and the United States. So now, altogether, 29 heads of states have signed the Declaration. They speak for more than a third of the population of the whole world. And while we rejoice in this advance, we should think today of how much has to be done to make up for lost time. We try to understand the meaning of statistics of world population growth, statistics which measure misery in millions. But what we now hear in terms of terrifying statistics has long been known in terms of human suffering and human degradation. The price of past blindness and complacency has been paid by those least able to understand and least able to protest, by the poor and by the illiterate, and especially by bewildered women and unwanted and neglected children. Now there is a growing realization, I am sure, that we can deal with the vast world problems of poverty and hunger and ignorance and disease and hatred and fear and violence too, only if we deal with, at the same time with the problem of population. If we avoid or neglect the problem of population any longer, we shall utterly fail in everything else. It is therefore with a sense of eagerness and urgency that we embark on Human Rights Year. For it is under the banner of human rights that we rally to a new campaign a com campaign to prevent human waste, the utterly unforgivable waste of the most precious thing in the world, the potentiality of the human personality. We are concerned today with no less than the future of all the peoples of the world. The international community has a special part to play in this campaign. And we who work at the United Nations have a special responsibility. So it is with a due sense of the importance of this historic occasion and a due sense of our international obligation that I now formally present the declaration recording the signatures of the 17 heads of state. And I thank you, sir. <coughs> I thank the distinguished to your request, read the preamble to that resolution. The peace of the world is of paramount importance to the community of nations, and our governments are devoting their best efforts to improving the prospects for peace in this and succeeding generations. But another great problem threatens the world, a problem less visible but no less immediate. That is the problem of unplanned population growth. It took mankind all of recorded time until the middle of the last century to achieve a population of one billion. Yet it took less than a hundred years to add the second billion. 
and only 30 years to add the third. At today's rate of increase, there will be 4 billion people by 1975 and nearly 7 billion by the year 2000. This unprecedented increase presents us with a situation unique in human affairs and a problem that grows more urgent with each passing day. The numbers themselves are striking, but their implications are of far greater significance. Too rapid population growth seriously hampers efforts to raise living standards, to further education, to improve health and sanitation, to provide better housing and transportation, to forward cultural and recreational opportunities, and even in some countries to assure sufficient food. In short, the human aspiration, common to men anywhere, everywhere, to live a better life is being frustrated and jeopardized. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I am very pleased to receive this declaration on population growth and human dignity and welfare. I want to express my particular appreciation to Mr. John D. Rockefeller III, Chairman of the Board, both of the Population Council and of the Rockefeller Foundation, and who is with us here this morning, for his untiring efforts to secure ever wider acceptance of the Declaration. This document has now been signed by 29 heads of state or government, as just announced by the Chairman and the Distinguished Representative of the United Kingdom. There are important links between population growth and the implementation of the rights and freedoms proclaimed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It is therefore wholly appropriate that the date chosen for this ceremony should follow so closely Human Rights Day. It is also appropriate because nowadays population planning is seen not only as an integral part of national efforts for economic and social development, but also as a way to human progress in modern society. We observe today rapidly changing attitudes towards the population problem, particularly in the developing countries where the rates of population increase are usually so high. There now exists in many countries an expressed desire to limit the size of families, as illustrated by the fact that highly dangerous and illegal means are increasingly used for this purpose. The desire to limit the size of the family is not surprising. With an ever higher percentage of newborn children, assured of healthy and productive lives, parents do not, as in the past, see the need for a very large family to be assured of good care in their old age. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights describes the family as the natural and fundamental unit of society. It follows that any choice and decision with regard to the size of the family must irre irrevocably rest with the family itself and cannot be made by anyone else. But this right of the parents to free choice will remain illusory unless they are aware of the alternatives open to them. Hence, the right of every family to information and to the availability of services in this field is increasingly considered as a basic human right and as an indispensable ingredient of human dignity. The work of the United Nations itself in the population field has so far been relatively limited, given the importance of the problem. Against this background, I invited, 
in July of last year, governments, non-governmental organizations, and private individuals to contribute to a new trust fund for population activities. I renew this invitation today. Our aim is to expand our work in those countries where it is more needed and which request our help. We are concerned with the number of human beings on Earth. We bear an immense responsibility for the quality of human life in future generations. I have no doubt that we can succeed. Man has shown increasing ability to master his environment. He is now acquiring the knowledge as well as the means to master himself and his own future. It is his duty to do so for his own sake and for the sake of succeeding generations to whom we must bequeath a life worthy of human beings. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the distinguished Secretary General for his words. In this manner, I put an end to this act in which it has been publicized the decision taken by 17 governments to add their signatures to the Declaration on Population Growth and Welfare. 